Hello. The presentation that you're about to see describes recent research work undertaken within the Sustainable Building Programme at the University of Strathclyde, Department of Architecture. The work aims at drawing together both theoretical and practical components of architectural design in a way that can inform and support a self-reflective approach within practice around the development of or refinement of particular principles and processes that can be applied by a practice in designing buildings that can consume fewer resources, use less energy, and enhance the lives of their occupants. Of course, the best architecture has always been about these things, but the increasing prominence of what's described as the sustainability agenda today in both architecture and urbanism to suggests that a more widespread shift in design decision-making may well be underway, wherein design priorities are changing to reflect a new reality that is in part constructed on various definitions of what sustainability is, of aspects of ecological architecture, of environmentalism, green architecture, low energy and zero carbon design. These terms with sometimes conflicting values are variously adopted to describe a sustainable approach. The word sustainability is increasingly used within the vocabulary of architecture, but its popularity is coupled with a conceptual ambiguity. On the one hand, it suggests balance and setting limits, while on the other, there is an implied expectation of development, often aligned with economic development. The most widely accepted definition of the term sustainable development was given by the Brundtland Commission in 1987 as development that meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Of course, the notion of meeting needs is a complex and relative issue. But collectively, those needs must consider how it is that we can provide adequate shelter for the nine billion people who, within the next generation, will be occupying an increasingly hostile natural environment. The big challenge for those involved in shaping the built environment of the 21st century is to achieve this while ensuring that our architecture and our cities can continue to be instruments in our progressive evolution. Our collective ambition should be not just to respond to crises, but to develop as a species in harmony with the environment. To move towards forms of synthesis and equilibrium between the built and the natural environments. If, as is being suggested here, a tangible shift towards sustainability is indeed what is happening in architectural practice, an important question for those of us in academia is how is this being informed or theoretically underpinned? How do designers choose which of a variety of interpretations of sustainability to align with? There are issues of identity at the core of this, from a wide spectrum of values and approaches ranging from technology-based to ecology-based responses. What are the design principles and processes that are currently being adopted and embedded by practice? And how do architectural practices position or, or reposition themselves in response to the spectrum in a way that can inform their future work and support their developing design ethos. The presentation addresses these questions in summarising a process of structured engagement between researcher Carl Moultrie and a number of local practices. 
I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking the practitioners who generously gave of their time uh, to support this study and hope that it's been a useful experience for them and offered them an opportunity to reflect on how their own distinctive approaches can align with the complex social, environmental and economic aspects of sustainability. Hello. This work has involved me engaging with practitioners from Hypostyle, Pigeon Park, Assist, Gaia, Archeo, Design, and Arup, and the presentation provides an insight into their sustainable design approaches and reflections on the study. All the practitioners will describe their practice, sustainable design ethos and underlying principles. The case study buildings are both new build and retrofit and from social housing, private developer housing, commercial office and the education sector and provide an opportunity to see the principles and process in action. One of the case study buildings, Arup's retrofit and extension to Scotson House, is shown in more depth with interviews from Ha Design and Arup. But first, the framework for the presentation. Key texts from leading ecological architects and an environmental group identify a sustainability spectrum. Exemplar buildings or blueprints that are shaped by the principles are shown alongside. Sim van der Rijn championed low energy and ecological design in the 1970s and was a pioneer in integrating ecological principles into the built environment. In ecological design, Van der Rijn and Cowan set out five principles formulated from their many years of research and practice. The application of these principles involves an engagement or integration and sharing of knowledge across many sectors. The concept of an individual dwelling that can be self-sufficient with regard to its own energy and resource needs, by for example harvesting rain and recycling waste, was described in the seminal book The Autonomous House by Brenda and Robert Bale. Some years later, in Green Architecture Design for a Sustainable Future, the Vales went on to describe six principles as a basis for the green design process. The importance of designing buildings that are resilient to climate change and mitigate damage to the environment and are capable of adaption leads to a crisis planning scenario in Adapting Buildings and Cities for Climate Change, a 21st Century Survival Guide. The author of the book, Sue Rofe, describes the need for buildings to be resilient to climate change and be designed for longevity with low embodied energy. An holistic approach to sustainability reaches beyond buildings to encompass sustainable communities and lifestyles. The Environmental Group Bioregional and the World Wildlife Fund have developed the One Planet Principles to enable sustainability to be embedded into any process. One Brighton, designed by architect Field and Clegg Bradley, is a mixed-use residential development and is one of the first to use the One Planet Principles and is aiming to be both zero carbon and zero waste. As a summary, a principles matrix shows the alignment of the key text reviewed. The matrix indicates that a core set of principles align across all four sets. Additionally, the One Planet Principles outline social economic principles that are applicable to resident lifestyle choices, for example, with respect to food and fair trade. The process model developed for the case study analysis has the environmental brief at its core. The environmental brief encapsulates economic, social and environmental principles as well as functional requirements and is continuous throughout the design process. Integrated environmental strategies are set at an early stage, influenced by parameters to meet the design intent. With the emphasis on passive design as a way of reducing energy loads in buildings, computer modelling tools such as IES are used at the design stage. Evaluation systems such as BREAM are an increasing client requirement at the design stage with post-occupancy evaluation, testing the design intent and closing the loop. The sustainable design process matrix maps the principles, environmental brief, parameters, environmental strategies, evaluation and tools and techniques onto the RIB outline plan of work. It indicates a spread from setting sustainable principles at the outset, stage A, to post-occupancy evaluation of a building in use, stage L. The principles and process model were used throughout the study for review and discussion. We begin the practice interviews with Hypostyle Architects and their case study building Miller Street in Hamilton.
Clyde Valley Housing Association ran a limited competition in 2001 with Partners Community Scotland and Hamilton Ahead to design a sustainable social housing development that would contribute to the continuing urban regeneration of Hamilton Town Centre. Hypostyle Architects won the competition and started design work in 2003. The completion was in 2006. I'm here with Jenny Hennigan, Director of Hypostyle Architects. Hello Jerry. Hello Carolyn. Can you describe your practice, sustainable design philosophy, ethos, and do you have a set of principles in place? Um, yes, uh, we have a policy, a sustainable policy, um, a two-page document uh, outlines kind of a holistic approach to uh, sustainability and the practices, holistic approach to sustainability, and it has three principles, really social, economical, and environmental. Um, we're developing our principles further. Um, and that's a, a thing we're doing, it's a, a long-term thing. Um, I think the thing that we're finding is the analysis of how the client approaches and responds to our principles. I think the response of the client sometimes is based on more the economic side of things rather than the social and environmental side of things. So the pr principles we're trying to develop at the moment is to try and almost educate the client from a social and environmental point of view. Um, because those principles, although they're set for the practice, uh, the best response comes to them from the client. Because um, if you don't have your client on board, then it becomes much harder to develop a sustainable design at the end of the day. I think the policies uh, themselves help our staff, uh, but they're a, bit, a better benefit almost to the client. Can you describe the environmental brief for the project? Yes, um, the environmental brief was essentially to design around 28 to 30 flats on a very tight urban site to sustainable principles, which looked at env uh, environmental uh, issues and energy issues at the same time. Can you describe the design intent of Miller Street? The design intent is essentially to create an environmental barrier on this transition site between the kind of suburban area um, to the south side and the more urban area to the north side of a, a very busy main road. And what were the environmental strategies for the it? The environmental strategies for that were really to look at it from a, a two aspects, a pass, both a passive and an active aspect. From a passive point of view, um, all the living spaces were south-facing, have become south-facing, and we've created an environmental barrier to the north, which in the the north side of all the all the villa blocks essentially have kitchens or bathrooms or stair cores. So uh, the living spaces face south, uh, they have solar gain. Uh, the north face is super insulated all the way along. The larger windows are to the south side. So that's almost a very basic look at the passive ways we've looked at environmental strategy. From an active point of view, we have uh, solar panels on the roof which uh, preheat the water. Um, we also have normally in a villa block of this type with seven flats in it you would have designed an individual boiler to each flat. In this instance we have, we have two communal boilers of the same size which heat all the flats in the property so it's almost a communal heating system to each uh, property. Uh, we've recycled, we tried to use recycled materials and that was one of the initial principles. Um, it didn't work out quite as well as we hoped at the start of the design process. We hoped to have a recycled stone wall, uh, proved too expensive uh, and we had to use a reconstituted stone wall. We also looked at using a recycled steel frame, again from an economic point of view. Uh, we did quite a lot of investigation into it uh, with the structural engineer. Uh, and it pro again proved too expensive. The next practice is Page and Park Architects and the case study building is Carrickin, a new built office for the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park Authority. The competition brief was for a building to be a community hub, flexible workspace and to promote the sustainable principles of the National Park. Page and Park were appointed in 2005 and the building was completed in 2008. I'm here with Karen Pickering, Director of Page and Park. Hello. Hi there. So to begin I asked the practitioners to describe their practice sustainable design philosophy ethos and if they had a manifesto or set of sustainable principles in place. 
Well, we've been developing our sustainable principles for quite a long time at Page and Park, um, and now we really feel as though they're embedded in our, our whole kind of design ethos and, and all of our projects. Um, initially, we did have just a few projects which had the sustainability kind of label on them, but now all of our projects, we, we give these principles. Um, we have a sustainability checklist in the office, which all our architects work to, and we have a sustainability policy, which we all adhere to. So that's not just how we design, but it's also how we run our office, how we travel to the office, etc. So it's very much now um, a, a very kind of strong ethos in the office. Uh, we do also, we have a sustainability group, and this group has an overview of all the, the projects, and we kind of input within the design process. We have design reviews, and a person from the sustainability group will look at those design reviews. So there's always that kind of uh, check all the way through the development of a project. What was the environmental brief for the project? Well, we were lucky in that we had a very good environmental brief from our client here. They really had a strong sustainability strategy and they wanted this building to represent what, what, they, what they wanted in that. So when, right from the onset, we were, we were part of a competition process to win the project and sustainability was high on that competition agenda. So when we won the project, we started right from the beginning thinking about how we could make this building and how it could represent the National Park. The National Park is made of trees and, and rock, et cetera, and slate. So we've made the building from the, the green timber frame, the natural stone um, cladding on the front, the natural slate roofing, and, and also the, the timber cladding. Um, and we found that during the development of the brief, things came out from the client which also influenced how we designed the building. Uh, the building has now been complete for, for three years, and so we can see that the physical nature of the building works and meets us the sustainability brief. But what we're finding now is the social sustainability of the building is also working, and that's coming to fruition now. The people who work here really enjoy the building, the natural light, the natural ventilation and they had this open plan nature of working, which they didn't have previously. In their old building, they were in cellular offices and they were all quite insular. Here, all the departments can see each other and they can interact. They can meet within the, the street, which is a, a nice light, airy space with, with top lighting. So it really is a good place for them to work and I think it has improved their productivity. The engagement process was it of value to the practice and could you see value to other practices for future research work? Well, we found it very valuable because it enabled us to really reflect on how we design in a sustainable manner and just kind of check what we were doing. You kind of made us kind of reflect on that. I think from your point of view, how you could maybe use your dissertation, your research to take to other practices is maybe practices that don't have such a strong sustainable policy, you could maybe market that and, and help that practice um, develop that so you could really set up the template and really help them set up their own um, I suppose checklists, their own way of designing in a sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you. The next practice is assist architects and the case study building is a combination of conservation, retrofit and modern intervention of two grade A listed 19th century tenement buildings in the grass market in Edinburgh's historic old town. The client for the project was Hillcrest Housing Association in collaboration with Edinburgh World Heritage, Energy Savings Trust, Communities Scotland and Edinburgh City Council. The environmental brief was to refurbish the buildings for social housing in an energy efficient way to reduce carbon emissions. The design team led by assist architects were appointed in 2006 and work started on site in 2007 with completion in 2008. I'm here with Andy Jack, Director of Assist Architects. Hello Andy. Hi Carolyn. Can you describe your practice sustainable philosophy ethos? Do you have a manifesto and set of sustainable principles in place? We have environmental policies in place and we have a whole series of drivers that we use to ensure that the practice of architecture within ASSIST is sustainable. Um, this uh, embraces an ongoing commitment to, to, to ongoing skills training. We have in-house 
passive accredited passive house designers, we have in-house RAS accredited sustainable architects and a whole raft of in-house skills which are always applied uh, appropriately on an individual basis to each project um, that, uh, that, that we take on. Um, and the, the, the use of this knowledge and skill base uh, ultimately is to provide a balance between innovation and practical solutions and cost-effective solutions for our client. And I would say that is uh, most probably a reasonable summary of how we would approach uh, a, a project at the beginning. Can you describe the design intent for Gilmer's Close? The design intent had uh, a variety of, of drivers. The first, low carbon, low cost to Hillcrest Housing Association's tenants, uh, planning gain uh, in terms of conservation, because, uh, re respecting its location, and also uh, the environment of how the project was procured, uh, where multi-partners worked together, providing different types of resources, uh, from financial through grants to support through uh, expertise and knowledge, that um, without the partnering environment, the, the project would have been very difficult. What were the parameters of environmental strategies? In all these situations, one strategy alone won't, won't work, in that uh, you, you'll find that, uh, that a combination of different strategies are, would need to be applied here to, uh, to uh, be successful. With the existing building, the first thing that has to be put in place is to, 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 to improve the thermal envelope of the building as much as possible. And this was done at Gilmer's Close, providing new values of walls, roofs, uh, windows, floors, uh, in excess of the new build standards that, that were required at the time. We felt that that would provide a thermal envelope which we would then be able to, to address in terms of introducing uh, micro -renew renewables and various forms of passive solar strategies and uh, forms of heat recovery. The feedback that we are, we are getting um, at the moment is anecdotal and uh, we have to take on board the fact that we have been through one of the severest winters that we've had uh, on, on record. That the, that the modelling that was carried out in terms of uh, heat losses and sizing of ground source heat pumps and the amount of uh, heat recovery from our uh, uh, mechanical ventilation heat recovery unit and the sun spaces um, were all modelled on uh, an outside temper of minus six uh, during the course of the, the recent winter. Uh, on days on end we were experiencing nighttime temperatures falling below uh, minus ten and much lower. Uh, therefore the system has been presented with quite a challenge and uh, we are keen to find out how it uh, has performed. And thermal images that you're showing us, what do they prove? The thermal imaging was carried out by Edinburgh World Heritage and the, their analysis has confirmed that compared to the buildings round about uh, that, the, that there is a significant improvement in the thermal envelope uh, uh, resulting from the, the work that we've, we've done, which uh, is again important to be able to have evidence to suggest that what we thought we'd done in theory is actually working in practice. This is the whole uh, 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 part of the, the process so that we can find out what has worked and, uh, and build on that and areas which uh, may not have worked so well we need to look at these. But the ongoing research that we, we've got uh, with uh, um, the Macintosh School where we will monitor the, the buildings with uh, data loggers over a period of about two or three weeks recording 24-hour uh, uh, temperature profiles, humidity profiles, air quality profiles. That detailed information will then be used to see uh, how the other strategies of uh, ventilation and sun spaces um, and the heat pump, how they have all worked together. Are they working as we hope they would? Or um, have they worked better, have they worked worse? Mm -hmm. That will also be associated with um, daily diaries of how people are using the building because particularly with a slow, a slow response mm -hmm. uh, technology like the, the ground source heat pumps, which requires uh, 
um, uh, time to build up heat within the property? Um, if, uh, is that matching with how people are using the building and have they uh, adapted their lifestyles to, to, to the type of uh, energy uh, that's used for heating their, 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 their flats? Has the engagement process with myself and the university been of value to your practice? Yes, yeah, it's been very valuable in that uh, uh, that the the history of assist is very much embedded in universities. That uh, assist initially was a research unit of Strathclyde University, and uh, we have tried to maintain links with academic institutions, including Strathclyde and uh, other architectural schools, through our practice. Um, the school should always be at the forefront of change, evaluating what practice is doing, um, reporting back what, it, what they're doing right and what they can maybe do better. So uh, this is uh, an essential part of our approach to continual improvement and uh, the, 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 the research that you're doing, Caroline, is very welcome. The next practice is Gaia Architects and the case study building is the Caracal School on the Ardnamurkin Peninsula. The client Highland Council wanted a pilot sustainable school and set high aspirations. Gaia Architects were appointed to develop the brief in 2004 and subsequently to provide architectural services. The building was completed in 2009. I'm here with project architect Sam Foster. Hi Sam. Hi Carolyn. Can you describe your sustainable design philosophy and do you have a manifesto set of principles in place? Sure. Yes, we, we do have a manifesto which was originally set up by the principal of the practice, Howard Little, when he set up in 1984. And that manifesto still applies equally today as it did back then. And we, it's on our wall, we, we see it every day, so it, it's nice to see that. But from that we've developed six principles for guiding each of our projects and those principles are minimising pollution, enhancing biodiversity, using resources effectively, creating healthy environments, supporting communities, and the sixth most important one is what we call managing the process, which is making sure that all of those five things and the targets in those five criteria actually happen. Can you describe the design process for a caracal? Well, we did use those, those six principles all the way through, and it was a very good project. The first thing we did is we looked at the community side of things and we made sure that the staff and the children and the community of the existing school were heavily involved in the design process and through that design process we came up with a very simple layout for the school and that layout had a, a central core, a very welcoming central core with a classroom wing facing south off to the left as you come in and a community wing up to the right to give you that flexibility of function. The Layout itself was designed to be as compact as possible and the shape of it was optimised so that it was as efficient and as compact as possible uh, because we were trying to make it as energy efficient as possible. And the way we did that was to maximise the insulation and maximise the air tightness, so reduce the amount of drafts lost through that. And we have a lot of roof lights, we have a lot of windows which are there to provide a lot of daylight so that we don't need uh, artificial lights. And that's complemented by a, a natural ventilation system. So we've got low level and high level windows in the classrooms, which are operated by a combination of the, the users and the, the building management system to keep the building nice and healthy. In order for us to keep, uh, or in order for us to have a very energy efficient, healthy building, we decided to use a construction system called Brechtstapel, which is a glue free solid timber construction system. And this was the first example of its kind in the whole of the UK. So it was very exciting for us and for the client. And that's delivered a lot of uh, positive things for us. But one of the best things is that we've ended up with a, a very small heating demand. And that heating demand is met by a wind turbine up on the back of the, the, the hill just behind the school. And about Stapel provides a timber aesthetic. How did you decide on the finishes and colour? The British Stapel itself provides the internal finish to a lot of areas in the school, such as the entrance, parts of the corridors, parts of the classrooms. And the Brett Staple is very good because when you use it on a ceiling you can put what's called an acoustic profile in and that helps to reduce the reverberation times in the classrooms which assists in learning. As well as the Brett Staple which is very good at helping to control moisture and provide re reductions in the thermal fluctuations, 
We've also used uh, untreated materials like clay plaster and other bits of untreated wood, uh, linoleum, solid oak floors, and all of these are chemical free materials which are very good for the indoor air quality. And all of those materials were complemented by a comprehensive colour strategy that was applied throughout the school. Now, the colour strategy was originally developed for the inside and the outside of the school, but for one reason or another we just used it internally. And the colours that have been chosen aren't arbitrary. They've been selected very, very carefully by a very good colour consultant to enhance well-being and increase social interaction and provide very comfortable spaces for the children and the staff and visitors to come in and use. And we've even had very good feedback from, from people coming in saying how calm the spaces feel because of the colour. And what other feedback have you been getting? How is it working? We, were, we have been employed by Highland Council, the client, to carry out a post-occupancy evaluation on the school for two years since it was completed. And that was, the school was completed in May 2009. So we're still carrying on the post-occupancy evaluation just now. Each of the classrooms has feedback monitors. We've got relative humidity, we've got carbon dioxide, temperature and daylight meters in each of the classrooms so that the pupils and the staff can see what's going on. That's been very, very useful because all of that information is also fed into the building management system so we can record what's going on in terms of those four parameters and we can see whether the temperature is going up too high, the relative humidity is too high or too low. And so far, the feedback has been quite good. We've found out that the relative humidity is staying generally between 40 and 60%, which is good for human health. Temperatures aren't going too high, they're not going too low. Carbon dioxide, importantly, is not going too high either. So the feedback has been okay. It's not been too bad. We're quite proud of what we've achieved so far. So have you experienced any issues? There have been, yes. There have been one or two. All, all new projects, all innovative projects have teething problems. And we've found not so much that the Brecht apple has given us a problem, that's been very robust and we would recommend it for certainly other uh, education projects where they get a bit of stick. But the, we found that the clay plaster that we'd used to, to ameliorate the relative humidity levels, it's not as robust as gypsum plaster. So where it's been applied at low level, it's been bashed and it's, in hindsight, we, we are only using clay plaster now on areas above the, the damage zone up to about two metres, above two metres we'll use clay plaster. Um, it's energy wise it's, it's performing quite well. The energy meters, the readings from the energy meters are suggesting that it's performing within the top 25% of schools throughout the UK. Thank you. The next practice is Archeo and the case study is Craigwood Homes, a development of 36 eco-houses for the private market and 12 affordable homes. The rural greenfield site north of Inverness is part of a larger master plan to develop the town of Dingwall. Arkeel have been developing proposals with the client OER Group since 2006. I'm here with project architect Neil Harper from Arkeel. Hello Neil. Hi there. Can you describe your sustainable design philosophy and do you have a manifesto set of principles in place? In relation to Craigwood, we've been working with a subdivision of Arkeel called Arkeel Sustainable Futures to help us inform uh, the best practice that we follow. Their, their and our policy uh, is based on a document which was uh, developed at the World Architects Congress in Chicago in 1993, mm -hmm. which helps set out a policy of best practice to follow on a day to day. Um, and for Craigwood, what was the environmental brief? The environmental brief on this one was to create a contemporary house uh, which avoided the attachments of eco-bling that are sometimes found in projects of this type but really to get the fundamental design principles of the house right um, to create a house type that is cheaper to run on a day-to-day -day, uh, use. And how did you work this through the design intent? Well we've looked at again basic first principles of the site um, are that we, we face south um, which is ideal for a house of this type, um, as well as the sort of fantastic views out towards the Crom Cromery Firth and the Black Isle, uh, which the site offers. That helps us set up um, a quite unique plan, which we've flipped the, the living accommodation to put all the principal living uh, areas, like living rooms, dining rooms um, and kitchens, where the family really comes together, putting that up on the top floor of, of the house, which, with the natural gradient of the slope, a sloping site uh, allows you to, to view over the house in front. Um, we've also looked at three levels of specification for the house. 
Um, we didn't want to tie the client down um, to any one spec at this early stage, given the length and duration of the project. Um, so we've looked at a house type um, which we can adapt um, both in size and also in terms of its specification, whether that's something that meets and exceeds building regs at the moment um, or something that leads all the way up to passive house certification. Um, and how was this tested? Uh, In-house we have um, I, I, IES software, uh, which is environmental software which allows us to really test every aspect of the building from the way in which it's built up and the, the wall constructions, the roof constructions, windows, doors, U-values, the whole lot. It can all be tested and refined down um, to meet the expectations of the client. And was this part of the marketing strategy? In a way, yes. Um, unlike uh, a lot of developers, uh, we're creating a prototype house, a show home, which will actually be lived in, um, potentially by the family themselves. Um, one of the members of the, the client group has offered uh, or has suggested the idea of moving in with his family for a year into the first prototype house, um, show commitment to the buyers and also to, to really allow us to fully test the, the environmental credentials and um, confirm in real time the testing that we're carrying out at the moment. So it's quite a unique model in that respect. Mm -hmm. And all of this information will be fed back to their main website, um, which will allow potential buyers, as they're keeping an, an eye on the project, mm -hmm to see how these houses are actually performing. Um, and we'd hope that they would perform as well, if not exceed the, the sort of performance that we're expecting from them. And they can visit the house? Yeah. They can, yes. Um, we're hoping, or the client has even suggested, that if uh, buyers are interested in, in taking up uh, one of the plots, then he would offer uh, them the chance to, to stay in the house with their family overnight, um, to experience a day and night living in a house which is quite unique and quite different to your ordinary cookie cutter style housing. I'm at the offices of Arup, Scotson House, to talk to the designers and end users about the retrofit and extension to the modernist building. Scotson House was designed in 1965 and is located in the semi-rural outskirts of Dalmeny in South Queensferry. In 2005, Historic Scotland listed the building as Grade B due to its iconic modernist design. The design team was led by Ha Design, who provided architectural, interior design, workspace consultancy and landscape services. Structural and services engineers, environmental and sustainability consultants and project manager were all ARAP. The QS was Nelson Binney Mackenzie. Construction started in 2009 and the office was operational once more for ARAP in June 2010. The main contractor was Ashwood Scotland. What was the brief for the project? As you're aware, uh, the, the building is 45 years old, the original building. The building had become unflexible. Uh, it was a tightened space for workstations. Uh, the area itself was a thousand square metres. Um, the original building uh, could accommodate 90 workstations. We now have 140 workstations. The plan aimed basically to bring new life to the original building and to extend the facilities. Uh, and these facilities are new meeting rooms, new entrance area, uh, nicer breakout areas uh, and better facilities for the staff themselves. I'm now joined by Sarah Jean Stewart, mechanical engineer and Bream assessor with Arup and sustainability coordinator for the project. Sarah Jean, how would you describe Arup's sustainable design philosophy and do you have a manifesto set of principles in place? Um, Arup have got a designing sustainable buildings strategy which they sort of set out just before we started on this project. Um, the, the principles are very high reaching so it's a set of goals to aim for at the start of each project and that the key goals are carbon neutrality, self-sufficient by using and reusing water, built using sustainable materials, able to cope with future climate change, um, able to provide benefits to the local community and also sustainable in operation. And th these are the sort of key targets that you you should try and achieve on all projects. Can you run through how these were achieved at Scotston House? Um, in Scotston House, we, we started looking at the actual building itself 
and you know because it's an existing building we had to upgrade the insulation we had to put in much better windows um, we put in a whole load of light pipes so that we would get daylight across the floor plate uh, we also installed a biomass boiler to provide part of our heating load from renewable energy um, in relation to self-sufficient by using reusing water it wasn't possible for us to install a rainwater collection tank so all of the water appliances within the building are all low water use. Um, in relation to built using sustainable materials, you know, we reused the building itself. We also reused the garden wall um, and we, we selected materials that have got a green guide rating of A. Um, in relation to able to cope with future climate change, we designed the drainage system uh, so that it would use sustainable urban drainage techniques. So we've got porous paving and we've got swales. Um, in relation to sort of community aspects, we developed the design with uh, consultation with the local community and Historic Scotland. Um, and we, we also sort of installed bird boxes, bat boxes um, and sort of various sort of ecological improvements. And then finally, we looked at sustainable in operation because uh, there's no point in designing a low energy building and the lights are left on all the time. So when the, sort of, uh, when the sun comes across, all of the lights in the floor plate dim down so that you just have sunlight providing the light. Um, and we also provided sort of controls for the biomass boiler and when there's no one in the building, none of the systems are on, you know, these are going to reduce it further. How were the targets met in the design process? We kind of set out the targets very early on at brief stage and we had sort of a target rating of very good which we agreed with the planners in relation to Bream. We also um, had a 10% renewables target, also agreed with the planners, and an energy performance certificate of A. And because we monitored this throughout the design process and tried to, to better it constantly, we got a lot higher than we'd, we'd actually originally targeted. So the final building got an energy performance rating of A+. Um, it used 15% renewables from the biomass, and we also got a, a BREAM sort of excellent rating so you know we did a lot better than we did originally targeted for an existing building. And how would you describe the design process? The design process um, sort of had to be collab collaborative and holistic you know and all of the solutions had to be developed closely with the architect you know um, the ventilation strategy it's all naturally ventilated the daylighting strategy how to upgrade the fabric but meet historic Scotland's needs um, so, you know, we, we work very, very closely with, with the designers. Ha. Right. Thank you, Sarah Jane. You're welcome. I'm now joined by Gillian Lockyer, Associate and Project Architect with HA Design. How would you describe HA Design's approach to sustainability? I have been designing uh, sustainable buildings for a number of years and using BRIAM for about seven or eight of them. Um, although we don't have uh, a set of set principles or guidelines, we have an inherent approach to sustainable design and we tend to tailor each of our designs individually to our clients as opposed to having a fixed set that we used to. In saying that, I think we have been looking more recently at uh, developing a set of guidelines or general principles. However, that's more been driven by the changes in the industry and client awareness than actually changing the way that we design within our own systems. And for Scotson House, how was the sustainability embedded into the process? Sustainability was embedded from day one. Um, the client uh, made it very clear that the sustainability was an issue with the project and therefore we started on a platform of sustainability and through constant collaboration and conversation and dialogue uh, developed uh, solutions to the problems at hand. How would you define the parameters for this project? Probably the most challenging element was the fact that it's a grade B listed building. Not only that, it's also a modernist building. Um, and that prevented standard things in terms of sustainability for added insulation. So it was a bit more creative approach to what we could do. It was also very keen that we had to provide a good flexible environment and also that it was not sustainability any cost. Uh, the items that we put in or the measures that we used had to have intrinsic value. They weren't tokenist issues. And can you describe briefly the remodelling of the building? 
Effectively, we reduced uh, or retained the existing building. We put it back to open plan. We inhabited the internal courtyard and closed it off. Uh, we then built an extension building off to one side of it, um, which housed most of the core facilities and additional meeting spaces and social spaces, good places to break out. And the material choice, that was your remit. It was our remit. Again, listed building and the listed status impacted on that also. The materials were chosen for a number of elements. One, again, we were asked to echo the existing building and the grade B listing. So we have similar elements of timber, concrete, steel, lots of glazing, large open windows, um, set against some very simple white plasterboard and white finishes um, and dark carpets. So effectively we're creating a very classic base that can then have uh, different fit outs added on as the years go past. Thank you, Jillian. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm here with Wayne Butler, Mechanical and Services Engineer with Arup. So Wayne, can you tell us about the key environmental strategies of the project? A key issue for the project was to make sure that the thermal comfort for the occupants was optimised. Uh, it's something that we do on uh, all of our projects. Uh, for this building, it, it was key to make sure that the heat gains were minimised first for the building. Uh, so we, we spent an awful lot of time doing daylight analysis to get the, uh, the arrangement for the solar tubes correct. By getting that arrangement correct, the artificial lighting would be turned off in the design summer day for the project, so there'd be no artificial light and heat gain to the space. We also invested quite heavily in a high performance glass for the perimeter of the building. Again, that was to reduce the solar heat gain into the space. And finally, we put in an active thermal mass system. Uh, that system allows us to absorb heat from the building in the daytime and reduce the temperature. And then we release that at nighttime with a nighttime cooling system through motorized ventilation louvers. This approach is uh, shown on the first slide of the presentation and it shows the, uh, the way that the, the building uses buoyancy forces for natural ventilation and the, the high performance glazing and the solar tubes. The next slide shows a plan of the building and what I've done for this is to summarise the thermal analysis results for the worst case corner of the building which is the south east corner. The next series of slides show the results of our thermal analysis software uh, the way that we approach it is to look at the comfort of the buildings rather than just the temperature within the space. So that looks at things like the air movement, path, radiant temperature, what the people are wearing and what they're doing and the relative humidity. And by optimising those, then we can improve the comfort of the people. So the, the slides go through from 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon of a comparison between a building regs compliant building and what we did for Scottsdale House. So on the left-hand side of this screen is a building regs compliant building and Scottsdale House is on the right-hand side. Now to explain the colours on the, on, on the graphics, uh, we would want to be in the green or yellow range of uh, conditions, which is a percentage of people dissatisfied to ISO 7730 of uh, between 10 and 20%. So at nine o'clock, you can see that the conditions for both, uh, both models are pretty well identical and, and ideal. As you then roll through to 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, the conditions for the building regs compliant building are starting to creep up into the 20 to 30% range. So that would start becoming slightly uncomfortable for the occupants. As you roll through the rest of the slides, you'll see the, uh, the Scotsdale House uh, model on the right-hand side stays within the optimum range, whereas the Building Rigs Compliant Building is starting to become quite uncomfortable for the occupants. Since we've occupied the building, we've now monitored the conditions uh, throughout the building, and uh, the last graphic shows a sample of a couple of weeks during the summer period when we had just moved into the building, the red line shows the external temperature for the building and the blue line shows the internal conditions. So you can see that the uh, internal temperature was ranging between 20 and 23 degrees C, uh, whereas the external temperature was going up as high as 25 degrees at times. So that shows quite, quite nicely that the thermal mass in particular is working really well with the nighttime cooling strategy and the conditions in the, in the office have been very comfortable for the occupants. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. 
I find Scotson House a really enjoyable place to work. I've got my own workstation, um, so there's nobody interrupting me there. It's a nice, quiet environment. However, if I've got um, clients coming in, we can sit down in one of the meeting rooms or um, sit down in one of the informal breakout spaces and have a coffee. OK, the, um, my favourite thing is obviously the ability to cycle to work because it's a good, sustainable way to get to work. It's a good way to start the day and we have the, the ability to do that here. We've got quite a nice storage facilities. It's securely locked. We've got a nice shower area, a dedicated cottage to it. And we've got our own lockers, our own personal shower room and changing room. Uh, I also like the comfort levels within the office. It's, the temperature is quite stable, the, there's fresh air, the CO2 monitors and all. So it's a pleasant place to work. It, it was a very uh, emotional building to me. I started work here as a graduate in 1978 and I've been here to, since 2011. And it was a super building when I first came here and adults were very, very proud of it. And I think one of the best things that, that the extension and the alterations it, it, it's worked very well together and I think it's engaged, firstly it's engaged with the um, wall garden in an improved way. Uh, we've got better uh, work uh, stations, much more open plan and superb breakout spaces uh, and, and, and the meeting rooms are, are, are excellent. I'm also proud of the fact that we've used our own engineering skills to create an environmental building that we can be proud of. As way of a summary and for comparison and cross-referencing, a principles and process summary is given. It shows applicable principles from the key text along with components of the process model. Now to summarise. The practices reveal common approaches as well as divergences in their principles and processes for sustainable building design. Though not all have a defined set of principles in place, all have transformed their design process to embed ideals of sustainability. There is no one common metric for sustainability and the spectrum is wide. The key text shows us the principles can be more than a useful checklist and can define an ecological approach. The first creative step is given as an alignment of practice ethos with established architectural principles across the sustainability spectrum. This ongoing research project supports the proposal that partnerships between academic research and architectural practice are fundamental in developing informed approaches to the sustainability of the built environment. In an increasingly competitive professional world, the ability of practice that may otherwise be committed to sustainable design and architectural quality, the ability to afford time to independently reflect on decision-making processes and to develop principles that inform an ethos can be necessarily limited or threatened. We propose here that a method of evaluating a practice's approach against well-researched sustainable design philosophies with practical application could help them move forward and that a structured dialogue between researchers and practice representatives can support a self-reflective approach and an alignment of systematic principles and processes with the distinct design philosophy of the practices involved. Thank you.